going south, going south. South, going south. All right, uh, planet. Uh, welcome to Talking South, episode ten, and this is take five. <laughs> is our fifth try, try to, to get uh, this thing uh, online, and it has to be a recording because all these uh, live apps uh, that I paid for on my phone they're just not working. So. Um, Anyway, we're not here to talk about apps, we're here to talk about the uh, fiascos of others. And here with me from a sailboat, in uh, a reliable sailboat, I, I hope, that is, you know, working, keeping you dry. Uh, in, uh, Ooh, don't jinx it. Don't, don't do a Bernie Saunders on me. Yeah, in the, in the Mediterranean, uh, in the Gre Greek oceans, we have... Um, uh, Lord Yu, and uh, you've been following the latest developments in uh, Extinction Rebellion, XR London, on the tube trains, so take it away, Lord Yu. Okay, so I've only got like one bar on 4G um, on this little, little island in the Ionian where I'm get off in the dark. So if, um, if we can't sustain the video, we might just have to switch the video off. But okay, so yeah, so I, I'm with you. I'm... If I'm presuming you're ready to call the latest XR action a fiasco. And I'm definitely calling it a fiasco. So now, let's qualify. I understand the tactics. I understand where everybody's going. I understand that the aim is to cause disruption, to get the dialogue going. I understand all the tactics. But according to the script, the ideologue... Uh, Roger Hallam, he laid out the strategy. Your strategy is a dumpster fire. It is not working. So let's talk about why and what to do next. But now the patient is dying on the gurney. <laughs> the first thing you have to do is tell the truth. And the truth is your strategy is not working. The rebellion is failing. Something has to change, or this we're going to lose this patient. He's going to die. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Now, the first thing is, why is it failing? Well, it, okay, let's let's just analyze why it's a fiasco. Why I think we both agree that it's a fiasco. If you are doing satrugyaha and satrugraha, um, you know, basically nonviolent tactics, Gandhi's tactics. Uh, these are not Gandhi's tactics. If you, if you are get, you are trying to do momentum building, get 3.5% of the population on your side, based on Erica Chenworth's uh, philosophy of rebellion, you are not getting 3.5% of the people on your side if you are getting violence on the tube train like at Canning Town today. If you have a protester on the train trying to cause disruption, and the passengers pull him off the train and start kicking him, and he needs protection. If you have a, a PR representative from XR that gets beaten up by a camera person trying to record, it gets beaten up. This rebellion is going against your own tactics. You need to recruit the middle ground, all the liberals, by Erica Chenworth's philosophy. You are not recruiting people, you are alienating them. This is inevitable because you're doing the same three uh, tactics three times in a row. Uh, it worked in April. You, in April, yes, it was, it was lively, it had verve. Uh, it failed in the summer rebellion. In the summer rebellion, you should have basically said, we need to backtrack. It was lackluster. You could see it going off the boil to basically double down on the same tactics that are failing in autumn is a disaster. So let's not pretend to anybody that this is getting the conversation going, or let's be positive, or let's just say that, yeah, look at the bright side. We got on uh, BBC, we got on mainstream media, we're raising public awareness. 
there's a good and bad publicity, and this is bad publicity. If you get Piers Morgan on the BBC talking to Mr. Broccoli, and it goes down <laughs> as like a lead balloon. That's all I want. <laughs> you know, <laughs> time to pause, time to reboot this. This is a disaster. So, okay, now uh, let's start talking about what's wrong and what we do about it. How yeah, about and uh, if I can uh, just inject there, uh, I can totally uh, see the position of uh, the uh, uh, grumpy commuters uh, waiting for the train to, to work. I mean, I've been there. I've been uh, standing on the on the subway waiting for my train, uh, you know, uh, in, in my past. And it's like everything that happens or doesn't happen annoys you because you are you have barely slept you know because uh, whatever your family or you've been partying or whatever and you have to go to go to work and uh, it's uh, everything is fucking annoying and then these you know middle or upper class uh, twats are, are there blocking your fucking tr tube train i mean i can totally see <laughs> why they dragged him down and said fuck off you know so uh, i think it's i think it's very tone deaf of xr to really go there and, and the the one of the other main things about this tube block uh, action is that they had actually a citizens assembly at the trafalgar square you know the, the entire crowd of xr people they sat down and they talked about should we block the tube train and they decided not to, you know? And what happens after they decide not to go ahead with it? Yeah, XR uh, HQ headquarters, they send out a press release, we're gonna block the tube train. And then all the people who, who lost the vote uh, at the um, at the uh, Citizens Assembly, they go right ahead with, uh, with, uh, with blocking the tube train in, in two of the working class uh, areas of London. In, in the in the morning rush, uh, and that's I want to have your input on that because I think obviously it's an, anti democratic to not respect the uh, vote, but I would I would say it's also anti anarchist anarchistic because even in anarchistic societies, you if you have a, a group decision, people are supposed to respect it to to an extent, right? Yes, I mean, collective responsibility is part of anarchism. I mean, yeah. some would say it's the core of anarchism. Yeah. So, no individualism is a capitalist idea. And yeah, but I, I think we should call into question the entire tactics um, of the whole rebellion. I mean, just, uh, let's not get too bogged down in the specific thing about the tube train. The. It just, but but it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of the hair that uh, breaks the camel's back, right? It's, yeah, uh, it, it exemplifies because, the fact that the tactics are wrong. They basically yeah. disruption was disruption, but it's not to the core, basically the people that they're trying to get attention of, and they're trying to get attention of the politician. Yeah, and so, it, it, comes okay, on, it comes from the back of a, a, a very failed uh, fire hose with, uh, you know, some red water, some blood. Uh, yes. Uh, so spraying yeah. from a from a fire hose and, and where they totally didn't rehearse so they, they lost control of the fire hose and could have killed somebody you know and and that's uh, that action failed action came on the on the back of the uh, infamous uh, Heathrow drone attack action which totally flopped so it's, it's like and that and, and, and the drone action was also decided against in a uh, XR, uh, you know, forum or, or, or uh, decision-making process, they XR after three years, three months of debate, decided not to go ahead with drone flying at Heathrow, and then the minority, even Roger Hallamun himself, just went right ahead and flew drones, and they failed because they couldn't even get them flying, right? So, yeah, but the the major. The major damage caused by that drone strike is now in the October rebellion because uh, Roger Hallam needed to be there to keep people on script. Yeah. So they went off script. You see what, what's, you know, they, they're doing street protests, which is a mistake already. 
But that is the strategy, so they have to carry on with it. Now, uh, if Roger was there, he would have kept them on script, I think. But now he's in basically, he's in um, women's scrubs, I being arraigned until February next next year. February, wow. It was disastrous planning, disastrous timing to actually basically have the leadership be AWOL at the time when the rebellion was in full swing. So the October rebellion was due from the start because it was inevitable that the police were going to take more um, more draconian action against it. Hmm. But that was part of Hallam's strategy. In the the time is right uh, or the time is now, the hard talk video that Roger went around basically prepping everybody for the autumn rebellion, he said explicitly what the game plan is. And the game plan is that the, you know, when the government reacts, you draw them out, show the violence, and when they react, it's supposed to be like uh, the Children's Crusade in Alabama in 1963. And, and at that point, everybody should have doubled down. And, you know, in the Alabama, they put more kids on the buses to bust them in and to amp up the pressure. But uh, because Hallam wasn't there on AWOL, uh, Gail Bradbrook was arrested a couple of days ago. As I understand, they, were, they, were, you know, they didn't have any guidance. The police uh, immediately ban everybody from the whole of London protesting in the whole of London, and everybody just rolled over in a supine fashion. And, you know, right at the point where if this was the Children's Crusade, they were supposed to up the ante, so they were supposed to get arrested. Mm. And, um, you know, basically, so they failed based on Helen's strategy, and he can't complain because he, he wasn't there. And he wasn't there because of the stupid drone straw, which uh, was had inevitable consequences that he knew. So basically, it's just it's just reinforcing the fact that they losing respect. They are trying to communicate a very serious message, dressed up as Ronald McDonald. In a, you know, this Krusty the Clown is not a good vehicle for <laughs> communicating uh, catastrophe. So uh -huh. you can't go and get in a clown suit. Um, you can't do Mr. Broccoli on the BBC with Pierce Morgan and try and be funny. This, you're just losing the public, losing the public. And you know, the stated aim was to get 3.5% of the public mm. because of an Erica Chenworth strategy. Now, that strategy is completely flawed. If you uh, basically, okay, let's just talk about the whole thing uh, from Erica Chenworth onwards. So, okay, Erica Chenworth and the strategy of 3.5%. To get 3.5% participation and do that kind of momentum building, uh, first of all, it's inapplicable to a, a liberal democracy. What Eric Chenworth was talking about is really fascist dictatorships. Um, and the other key point about she, she was very emphatic about something which XR now has glossed over. And that she said that 3.5% was not a magic number where magic happened and suddenly you got all your demands met. She said at 3.5%, get this, the police, the army, the security forces come over to the side of the people and they overthrow the government. Yeah. Now, what planet are you on where you think that in a liberal democracy like Britain, you get 3.5% of the people, which is, you know, two, 2 million people. Okay, but just to put this in proportion, the Brexit, the anti-Brexit march was a million people. Hmm. The government ignored that. But okay, let's say you do double anti-Brexit march and you get 2 million people. In what planet are you on that now... What, the Metropolitan Police or the Bobbies, the, uh, the RAF, uh, you know, NATO regiments and stuff suddenly come over to your side and what? Overthrow Parliament? Erica Chenworth's strategies are misapplied in this situation. Absolutely. Okay, first off, the reason why is this. They're misapplying politics as economics. So Erica Chenworth and all of these things, MLK, Gandhi, the suffragettes, all these wonderful examples are inappropriate. Why? 
because they're politics. Rebellion against climate change is economics. Get it? It's economics. You are trying to use political tactics and social uh, strategies that were developed by, by the state, the U.S. State Department to apply to third world dictatorships and get U.S. foreign po policy implemented by these kind of strategies by basically, uh, you know, agents, agent provocateurs in these third world countries. You yeah. can't take those strategies that the state, the U.S. State Department developed and use them in the U.S. or Britain in a Western democracy. So, yeah, if you uh, try and do that, what you're trying to do is get a political uh, outcome in a situation that really is all about economics. Mm. So you can't cause the disruption on the streets because basically it's it, the economic machinery just does a cost-benefit analysis. And to tell you the truth, if you blockade streets in London, the cost is not that much to the capitalist machine or the industrial machine or any of the economics or the financial industry, the insurance industry and the real estate industry. Basically, the mechanism isn't having much of a hit if you actually blockade streets. There's not much economic impact. Yeah. They will just do a cost-benefit analysis and say that's small change. In the, at the same time, you cause this uh, basically about a million um, pounds. pounds worth of, of, of damage in London. The London Stock Exchange made 10 billion on fossil fuels, <laughs> right? Do the economics. It's mass. Yeah. So you're losing. And so it's like uh, XRS. Yeah, political tactics in an economic situation, and that's the first mistake. So really? using political uh, uh, tactics, they're actually causing disruption to the working class citizens, which basically have to get on in the machine mm. and do their job so yeah. that they can earn a living and keep uh, running on the, the treadmill. So you they're get, pissing you off say, the uh, base of the primary recruit. And sorry. That's, it's, tragic. it's basically so conflicted. But anyway, go, go ahead. Yeah, you could, say, you could say that uh, XR activists have been uh, very polite in a way uh, by doing the exact same thing that they did in, uh, in April and, uh, and last uh, autumn. So they're, they're sort of, as you said, it's not a big uh, obstacle for the uh, industrial civilization or, or the capitalist economy. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, XR rebels are just doing the same thing and, and you know, blocking bridges and putting sailboats in the, in the, in the road and stuff. So they've been maybe too polite in, in not evolving into other ways of, uh, of fighting the, the struggle. Do you agree? Too restrained. Not, I wouldn't say too polite, too restrained. Yeah, yeah. So my view is that the climate situation is extreme. So I, I mean, uh, yeah, so the BBC, the mainstream, they challenged a lot of these spokespeople for XR. And they said, oh, you know, this is ridiculous what you're saying. Oh, six billion people are going to die. No scientist says six billion people are going to die. No. I say the opposite. They are not saying it outright. A scientist will never get on the tannoy of the Titanic and say, oh, we're all going to die. Because they're all erring on the side of least drama. They have to because of their professional capacity and to preserve their career. So to keep their credibility, they have to err on the side of least drama. So you're never going to get something that, you know, a paper coming out saying six billion people are going to die. But they say it. They say it indirectly in scientific speak. So when you see something where they say, well, there's going to be $70 trillion damage due to climate change. Well, the entire GDP of the globe is seventy trillion. So you have to do, <laughs> you have to work it out for yourselves. What they are saying is, the entire GDP will be destroyed by climate change. Therefore, the mass distribution of food and the mass production of food will disappear. Therefore, seven billion people are at risk of dying. At least six billion are going to die. Now, you get that from the paper that says. 70 trillion. Scientists are always going to be, you know, obfuscate what they are saying. They are implying that six uh, billion people will die. So uh, by saying things like, yes, we're heading on a trajectory for getting to six, uh, six degrees Celsius, uh, they know that their colleagues read, well, that's a six billion die-off. Yeah. So 
you so yeah that i mean that needs to be pointed out to people on the bbc saying yeah this is alarmist and we're not we're not at risk so we're we're at risk uh in my book uh, not because of this gradualism that the fossil industry has done a great PR job of convincing people of a number of things. One of them is it's incremental, it's gradual, it's mm. about uh, 2,100. Say, so, okay, get this straight. It's not about gradual climate change, it's about abrupt climate change. That's Absolutely. the risk. The and other that... thing is it's about climate instability. It's not about climate change. You cannot grow grain, you cannot feed no. the world in an unstable climate. I also so, think, yes, I also think that... Uh, uh, the economists that you are talking about, they've been saying, you know, they're sort of working together with the IPCC and they're, and they're saying things like, yeah, in 2100, uh, our GDP will be, you know, maybe 8 to 15 percent lower because of uh, climate change, right? And that's total lie. One thing is that it's impossible to say like 8 percent or 15 percent. And the other thing is that you won't have an economy by then, you know, if, if things go south, which they are obviously doing, uh, and we lose the ability to grow grains and to have a society, you can kiss your GDP goodbye, it's, it's not going to be there. And uh, even if it was there, there would be no people to to monitor it or, or, or calculate it. So it's like they've been downplaying this crisis uh, for at least as long as I've been alive, uh, since 1971. And uh, the latest literature on the climate panel is that they were only put, uh, put in place uh, to silence uh, the climate scientists who wanted some action uh, in the 1980s. Uh, because uh, there was a growing movement of uh, working climate scientists who said, this is going to be really serious. We need to do something on the society societal level. And then all these fat... Uh, billionaire bankers and industrialists and their government uh, friends said, uh, what do we do? Yeah, we create this intergovernmental panel on climate change. Then we can control the message and, and we can put out a report every five or seven years and say that, well, it uh, looks like it can be like 20 centimeters of sea level rise in 100 years. Uh, be very afraid, you know? I, I totally agree. I, I followed this story from the 80s, and uh, it was exactly as you say. It was just basically to head off uh, basically the concerns of, of the scientists. And um, yeah, it, it was entirely disingenuous. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, the, 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 I watched the dialogue as it progressed, and one of the important parts of the dialogue. Uh, in the 80s was how do we present uh, this really disaster scenario to the public? And I watched all the scientists come to a consensus that, uh, based on, on some good social science, that uh, you cannot make people lose hope. If you make them lose hope, basically they will become um, apathetic. And so they, that still is part of the uh, communication methodology to this day, that they, they will keep uh, the message hopeful and positive. Now, you've seen that even with David Attenborough and the BBC. They always were careful with things like the Blue Planet to make sure that it was always positive, that you always kept up the hope. Yeah. And now recently, say, you know, even... Um, even though the BBC and those kind of nature documentaries, they've been, been edging uh, to say, even David Attenborough is getting close to saying, guys, uh, <laughs> it's calamity. Uh, you know, there, there is no hope. We are heading for uh, a collapse. Um, and so, you know, we, we have to th start thinking more in terms of uh, adaptation, like Jim Bendel's adaptation, and far less in terms of, how do we avoid the catastrophe? You know, talking about the climate emergency as a problem to be solved is is very unhelpful. Yeah, um, and the, you know, basically, it's it's not it's not a it's not a, a an engineering problem that needs to be fixed. No, 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 no. It's uh, you just uh, you just have to uh, pick up some plastic uh, yeah. from the beach when you go on your Sunday stroll, and um, and that's or, or worse, you just you put up a solar panel and stop flying. <laughs> And you can carry on consuming. Yeah. It's like, 
It, so, so what XR, okay, XR needs to tell the truth. The first truth is to say, guys, it's over. <laughs> Industrial society is over. We've reached the limit. We are not carrying this on with, with nuclear. We are not transitioning to renewable energy. These are all magical thinking. They're delusional. It's time to basically say, guys, there is no way out. There is going to be a mass die-off. There are 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet. We cannot transition. There's no time to transition to some other kind of green utopia or green new deal. There, there is no way to feed these people if we carry on with business as usual because basically they, they will, we're getting to the point where there's not enough water, there's going to be crop failures um, due to climate change, and uh, so you cannot feed that uh, number of people as we are today. So you, you, you have no choice. There's going to be a die-off. You must get that message in soon because really, ultimately, What's at stake is how far that die-off goes. Well, that die-off will go to absolute extinction. It will go to the last person on Earth, depending on how late you are in admitting that we are collapsing. Right. So if you leave the admission of collapse too late, you won't be able to save anybody. Yeah. The sooner people admit around the world that this is a mass extinction, including humans, the, the greater the chance is that even a handful of people survive. And if, uh, you know, basically, as soon as we bite the bullet, the more that's left of the ecology of the planet. So that's important if we go extinct, uh, that something else lives on after us, even if it's just a cockroach. But it's also important from the fact that if there are pockets of people that actually survive the collapse of this industrial society, that, that they will have the best chance possible. And that's the point that we're at now. We're not at the point where uh, we, we're deciding how to transition off these harmful things onto better things and carry on. Mm. Uh, even if you took that strategy, we would only have a few years left because of basically we exponential growth. Yeah. So, you know, because of exponential growth, you come up with any solution, nuclear, whatever, you know, magic wand, and say, you know, whatever your magic wand fix is, I can say, yep, and then the population doubles, and your fix doesn't work anymore. So the kind of... Uh, the kind of doesn't the... fail then, just wait another year, and then basically the, the doubling will, will make it fail again. So we have to admit that basically collapse is unavoidable and, yeah. and get off this dialogue of, you know, we need to appeal to politicians to do something. No, that's uh, it, it, the, the politicians would do something if they could is, is my view. Yeah. Uh, the fact that there is an action on the politician part, I tend to think that it's because uh, they know better than the public than the, that there is nothing that can be done. I but agree. You know, and uh, if you look at the, a uh, very nice, very polite uh, Easter rebellion, which was also, you know, very sort of cool and uh, happening in, in London in April, right? Uh, you could say that uh, maybe, I don't know, uh, but maybe that was good for London and good for the economy because at least with all these colorful people in the street uh, and on the bridges, it looks, looked like, okay, something can still be done. Uh, we can still get uh, ahead on this uh, climate thing, uh, if only we let all these crusty, colorful people and the clowns and stuff uh, into parliament, then uh, we'll be saved, you know? Uh, so I can totally see why a city like London, which always has sort of been hip and happening and, you know, the, the latest cool stuff yeah, has been in London, right? So this is where I live. Uh, why that is allowed to go ahead because you know it looks like uh, there is uh, uh, a development and, and uh, some movement uh, towards uh, doing something and I think both of you and I know that there's nothing to do and the little things they are saying they will do like in the Paris Agreement or in uh, the UK Parliament for the climate uh, emergency declaration is just hot air and it's just, just uh, words, right? 
Yeah, I'm. Um, yeah, I mean, it's very trendy and a very avant-garde to be leading a controversial issue that everybody's concerned about, like climate change. Um, but I think we need to be more on track with what uh, Jim Bendel is saying. So now, if you have a look at Jim Bendel, he's just released this video where he's he's at a Zen retreat, yeah. which is not a good sign in terms. <laughs> That it, it looks like he's checked out. It just just the message that he said is saying the truth. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, 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 this is a guy that's given up. But yeah. okay, uh, he says some very interesting things. Uh, you know that are, are more in terms of a rebellion and, and more in terms of getting close to talking about insurrection. But anyway, I think these are good topics for adaptation. And the thing that really impressed me about what Jim Bendel said was was. Um, that, you know, this system uh, really is going to hang itself. Now, when he said that, his body language was awful. Mm -hmm. And the way he said it was awful. Okay. He knows that he's lying to himself. Okay. And we know that he's lying to himself. Is that this system is not going to hang itself. It's going to need encouragement. <laughs> Yeah. it's going to need assistance right <laughs> so we have to start thinking in terms of how we assist this system to hang itself okay so in that respect the reformers the people that want a transition uh greed new deals and things are probably the worst thing for the rebellion so i think it's time to get off erica chenworth's um you know misapplied uh, strategy, because it implies that you, you have to do momentum building, and that implies that you, you have to really um, uh, basically have a big tent and yeah. be non-judgmental about all sorts of crazy stuff um, just to build numbers. You, you have to be um, you know very open to any philosophy, and you have to be agnostic to any kind of political persuasion just because you have to be neutral enough to build the numbers. Yeah. But then you hang yourself because you can't be effective in, in actually doing something like helping the system to hang itself. A lot of the people are reformers and think that the system can be reformed. So a lot of the people come on board thinking, oh, it's all about nuclear. And, uh, and then, you know, they have to back off saying, well, well, we don't... XR is not in the business of telling people what the solutions are. We just basically getting the rebellion going and telling the government they must do something, mm. which has massive assumptions. One of the biggest is that the government can actually do anything, which is really yeah. up in the air. <laughs> um, and then the second thing is that, that you would want the government to do anything. right? Mm. The government can only do growth. They can't do degrowth. So automatically, by the, so the mere fact that you're appealing to the government to do something, you've put degrowth and deindustrialization, de rewilding, off the table. Yeah. Now, I would say that making the system hang itself means exactly those three things. Deindustrialization, yeah. de degrowth, and rewilding. So you can only put those on the table when you get off this Erica Chenworth strategy of uh, basically consensus building. Because mm. it's not a consensus viewpoint. You see, what, what has happened in Canning Town on the tube train, looking at the, the Joe public rebel against XR, mm. basically get violent. I mean, this is a non-violent uh, rebellion, and you're seeing the public get violent against it. That means the public is more committed to the cause, to their cause, than XR. XR doesn't actually have the courage of their convictions. It, you saw that they didn't have the courage of their convictions when the police actually shut down London, and they all complied. They all rolled over. They they didn't do, you know, basically the uh, the uh, children's march in 1963 in Birmingham, Alabama. They didn't all immediately have thousands stream into London to be arrested. Mm. They all vaporized, which means they didn't have the courage of their convictions. Well, the job public has the courage of the convictions because they need to get to work and earn a buck. Yeah. And so what you're looking at is more like something that's uh, dependency. So it's like a drug dependency, and you're looking at somebody that's more like an addict. They're a civilization crack addict. 
And that's what you saw those people pulling uh, the XR rebels off that train was they're saying, don't get them between me and my addiction. Yeah. So XR have to, has to think of it more in terms of an addiction. Now, people have said to me, like, oh, you can't go to war against the public. Well, they say that because of Erica Chenoweth and momentum building. I say, you have to go to war against the, the, the public in the sense that they have Stockholm syndrome, and uh, you have to think of it more in terms of getting in, into uh, an intervention on their drug habit. The, the drug addict is not going to basically be won over um, to, uh, to help with their own addiction. You basically have to make them fight for their addiction, and they won't fight very hard. But Exxon has to get to the point where they get over this uh, popularity, uh, numbers building stuff, and start um, intervening on the addiction. Okay, I, I, would, I would also say that uh, there seems to be uh, you know, a class uh, element that is totally ignored by XR to, to a large degree, because uh, you know what you say makes a lot of sense with with the the people on the on the on the platform waiting for the tube train they are they have the power of their conviction because you know they know what they are about the, today it's like uh, getting these bloody rebels out of the way so we can go to fucking work right uh, that's their uh, perspective and i think uh, i can tie that together with the, the clowns you are mentioning and the you know the the uh, Makeup wearing uh, red dress uh, hordes uh, at the XR and red rebels, yeah, yeah, that, that's a good message. Red, 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 red brigade or whatever they call themselves, they are sort yeah. of into the middle class, upper class pantomime, artsy fartsy theater uh, thing, which is very far removed from, from the everyday working class uh, people who care about football, work, beer, and you know family stuff and sex, right? Tits, tits and football. Uh, uh, which, you know, everybody is there, everybody has been there, you know, at least in their youth. Uh, so, I think that it's more and more uh, clear that the XR Rebellion is sort of a middle class um, cultural sphere, uh, drama studies, uh, whatever, uh, kind of group of people, and they, uh, they don't care so much about uh, the working class, and they don't care about, you know, getting really down to the details of the climate situation, uh, you know, lots of, lots of Abrupt climate change people are criticizing the XR for, for being too ex exclusive on that part and, and for deleting posts or, or uh, and kicking people out uh, when they are actually wanting to make XR see that the situation is, is worse than the IPCC says, right? But it's like some kind mm -hmm. of, it feels like some kind of uh, George Soros astroturf ish thing, and uh, there's some some guy called Peter, Sh no, some guy called Sharp or something who is a theor theoretician for color revolutions. Do you remember the name of that guy? Sharp. Sharp. No. No, I'm not sure. Maybe I don't. But the, but the color revolutions you heard about those, right? Like. Uh, waving an orange flag in Ukraine and stuff and uh, Oh right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like the Velvet Revolution in Yeah, I think like. I think the guy is called Sharp, something like Sharp. Uh, and uh, he's actually being used as uh, in in sort of the activist textbooks of, of XR. Uh, and it's like you said earlier today, it's like the US State Department has developed ways to change the re regime change through so-called peaceful means by using crowds and stuff and that's kind of the the feeling i get from from xr because if they were not astroturf and they, they were real grassroots they would uh more like embrace uh yeah i won't call myself an expert but uh, but uh, at least i'm a climate geek 
So they would more like if they were grassroots, they would they would embrace um, true skills when it comes to analyzing uh, what the IPCC is doing and how they are uh, sugaring the pill and stuff. And I don't think they would ever do a subway action like we saw today. Uh, and they wouldn't dress up in like clown suits and, and all kinds of stuff. Um, yeah, so it's it's difficult to tell whether you know it's controlled opposition. I mean, the thing Gene, is, Gene Sharp. Uh, Gene Sharp is the name of the guy I was thinking about. Oh, Gene Sharp. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so, but, but here's the thing I would say about that is, it's not worth really getting into that because you can never get to the, the bottom of where these, you know, what what these are all about fundamentally. Mm. But you can point out that it's possible to not be. Um, a controlled opposition or, you know, co-intel up, but still behave one like one because mm -hmm. of your tactics. So yeah. your, your tactics can um, be so self-restricting, like in the case of XR, all the, the rules of engagement are so restricting. In effect, they are what you would do in a controlled um, opposition operation. So, so you can be your own worst enemy uh, just because of your principles and stuff like that. So, you know, really the point of departure should be uh, the goal that you're trying to achieve, not your principles. So mm -hmm. it, it, this is one thing that, that I, uh, I really try and emphasize and say Reddit before I got banned was <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the, the, the thing is the, that, um, you know, you can't on the one hand, say that this is an existential crisis and then say, oh, but we have all these rules and it's going to be social justice and say, like, what is it? Huh. If it's an existential crisis, there are no rules. <laughs> yeah, like, no uh, rules. like the, in April, uh, they had, the, in April, they had this uh, rule to, even though they, it was an existential crisis and uh, everybody's life was in danger, yeah, and even though they were Easter rebellion went on for two weeks. You couldn't have one beer in the in the activist camp. That was totally off limits. So it's like a silly rule that you have uh, up against what you're actually talking about, right? Yeah, but isn't it, isn't it crazy that that uh, you know you don't have the courage of your convictions if you if you get dressed up in a clown suit to bring this message that the world is on fire. Mm. And to be the canary in the coal mine and all these things that they're telling themselves is like tell the truth and act, of it, act of it as if it's true. But if you really believe that there is an existential crisis, then to act as if it's true means that there's no holds barred, mm. right? So get rid of all the principles, get rid of, say, like, you know, what do we have to do to say, like, oh, you know, we're we not going to just say what we needs to be done. We're just going to do activism and, you know, climate action, whatever that means. Yeah. Say so like, well, if there was a real existential crisis, you would know exactly what to do, wouldn't you? I mean, yeah. if the Titanic's sinking, you say, basically, you want to stop it sinking. You don't say, well, we want to do activism to insist that the captain does something about the Titanic sinking. It's like, well, mm. you don't really believe the ship is sinking now, do you? Yeah. So you basically violated your own principle that you... And that's, not telling uh, yourself the truth, and you're not acting as if what you're saying is true. I, so, why exactly. the BBC or mainstream should take you seriously? Exactly, and uh, yeah. it uh, actually goes uh, straight into a discussion I've had many times in my 30-year uh, activist life. Uh, because um, you know, we very <laughs> early on uh, embraced the NVDA, Nonviolent Direct Action, which is actually a very, very progressive radical. Thing if if you do if you understand it uh, right, uh, and there are all kinds of distinctions, and I would say I would say highlight the distinction between going out there in a clown suit, uh, gluing yourself or whatever, and waiting for the press to arrive and the police to arrive. That is symbolic and not direct. I would say right, uh, a direct action uh, as uh, opposed to that would be to stop a digger from destroying a forest area or to build a, a military training uh, area which i've done uh, 
you sit out there for for uh, days and days and nights and uh, hold guard to to stop the construction uh, machines from from coming in. So uh, direct action, non-violent direct action, is to directly stop or prevent or do something, right? Um, whilst the more traditional symbolic action is getting your face in the paper, basically, yeah, in a newspaper. Uh, and I, I think, uh, and, you know, as I said on Facebook, to, on the XR groups today, yeah, you, you'd get in the media if you, if you went and attacked a Jewish cemetery, but it's not all, not all kinds of media exposures are gonna put you in a in a good light, you know, because we know we all know what kind of groups would uh, destroy a Jewish cemetery, right? So so they're sort of becoming they've gone become like media horse or whatever you call it. People just want uh, media attention. Uh, it's you know almost like uh, taking a nude picture of yourself on, in your bathroom and putting it uh, on Instagram. You know, it's like. Uh, you know, attention horrors, basically. Yeah. yeah, they're basically dick pics for climate change. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, so, the, I think, so Jim Bendel, again, uh, said something very interesting about where to go next. So, okay, so, uh, I think we have to accept that this is failing all around. So, so where do they go next? Now, I think... It's time to get off the streets, right? The streets are owned by the establishment. Um, it's time to get sophisticated. Uh, so, and it's time to go for the jug dealer. You're talking about direct ac action, like going for a digger. Here's the problem with these things, is that diggers and planes and, uh, you know, all these kind of things, attacking at that point is very, very far down the supply chain. Mm. So by the time you're attacking a plane as it's lifting off, um, that's very, very far down the consumer um, supply chain. You, you have to get way higher up uh, in the transaction sequence somewhere to where yeah, the guy finds it. Just, uh, just let me clarify, let me clarify uh, well, very quickly, because uh, when I was in the Newbury Bypass uh, uh, anti-motorway action in England in in um, yeah in I was right there in Manchester yeah, in uh, yeah, 1996 1996 uh, there was a guy called Swampy who became a, a very famous um, media activist but he didn't want to be in the media but you know he was such a good uh, activist so he came in the media and he went on to he went on to um, to block the construction of a new runway at Heathrow or some other air, major airport, and and what I mean what I mean about uh, direct action as opposed to symbolic action was that they didn't run out in the runway construction area to get their picture in in the paper. They ran out during the night and dug themselves in. Literally, they dug tunnels under the construction area. And, and chain themselves inside those tunnels so they could very hardly, very difficultly be, be taken out. That's the kind of direct action I'm talking about. Not not stopping uh, individual planes taking off from a new runway, but actually going in there to physically stop using your body, uh, whatever, um, a, an unwanted uh, development. Uh, you see what I mean? So you can actually go up... Uh, high up in the chain and try to stop a high up development um, using direct action and not waiting for the police, not waiting to be arrested, but you know, trying to delay it or stop it physically. Yeah. I think though it's it's not thinking big enough. Mm. So in terms of the scale of the problem we can't expect, in, just like you can't expect individuals to make a difference by not using plastic straws, you can't, by the same token, expect individuals to make a difference by lying in front of diggers. Those days are over. Mm. So what I, where I'm coming from is uh, a, a very radical view, I think, in terms of how desperate the situation is. But 
from my point of view is basically I my thinking is it's all about the meat right and if you if you go and look at the 2019 paper you know from Natalia Shakova and Igor Samelitov yeah and you look at what they say about the ESAS and the Arctic methane, I think that's the biggest threat. So I say basically forget about 2100, forget about sea level rise. Is basically We have one serious problem that's looming, and that's basically a major um, methane eruption in the ESAS. So mm -hmm. I don't care what they say about the clathrate gun hypothesis has, uh, uh, is, you know, is basically totally been debunked. It hasn't been debunked. The USGS did a review of all this, the, uh, the the literature in uh, 2017, and they said that now it's you know methane has been coming out for two million years, and so therefore there's nothing to worry about. Hogwash. Mm. Basically, the observational scientists like N Natalia Shakova and Samalitov have been coming back and saying that it's boiling up there. Yeah. So basically, you read that paper, you have one choice: you can either believe them. And then say we are in serious, serious trouble. Mm. Or otherwise, you can say no, there's something wrong. You don't believe them that they renegades, whatever. In which case, uh, I'm prepared to believe some other scenario, like the IPCC is right. But if they are right, we are in serious, serious deep trouble. And that means we don't have time. We don't have years. We basically, we, you know, in 2012, Igor Samalatov came out and said that at any time we can get a major 50 gigaton eruption yeah. from the east coast, from those cloud rates. So if, if that happens, it's game over. We, we're heading for six degrees Celsius. And yeah. then there really are six billion people died. Maybe there's nobody that comes through. So if that is where we are, then, then there's only one thing to do. And it's not, you know, basically talk about thorium reactors and how we can carry on this industrialized civilization. We have to bring it to a stop now. And it's just a race, is how quickly will people come to the psychological realization that this game is over. It's yeah. not about solar panels. It's not about wind turbines. It's about stopping industrial civilization in its tracks. Just That's, taking the, um... the dimming consequences and just seeing what we have left. But to do that, basically, there has to be a radical monkey, monkey wrenching. Basically, it's, it comes down to basically halting the um, industrial machine. The global economy has to be seized in its tracks. And that's, uh, and that's, that's what we're uh, on about, uh, you know, uh, the uh, methane situation in the Arctic is very linked to uh, how soon the uh, Arctic sea ice is going away. That's the only reason I, for instance, are, uh, am, uh, you know, charting and following the, the sea ice, which I will do right after we hang up uh, today. Mm -hmm. I will continue this stream with, with uh, some uh, decade uh, analysis of what, what the sea ice has done for, for the past decade, which is actually showing a fingerprint of the methane situation in midsummer uh, in, in the graphs itself. And and that's also the the main reason. Yeah, you 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 said you you were yeah. um, thrown out of uh, the XR Reddit uh, subreddit, uh, and uh, I've had my uh, conflicts with with the XR as well. And and they always started uh, because I've studied this uh, Arctic stuff for like five years, like every week. Uh, almost every day uh, and uh, I know for a fact by studying the data itself I know for a fact that the IPCC is sugaring the pill and, and trying to, to sell a watered down uh, version of climate change uh, like you said uh, gradualism we just need to cut 5% to 10% in, in 30 years from now or whatever uh, so I know that the situation is like uh, for me and my, my computer crashed the other week uh, where I tried for eight days again and again to do, just remove these uh, files and, and, and reinstall this and, and do all these kinds of, of, of small fixes on my on my computer system and in the end the only thing that worked was to delete the entire system <laughs> if you get the if you get the double meaning 
So I had to just uh, eradicate the, the entire system uh, on my Mac and then get a, get a new system uh, up from scratch and you know delete everything. Uh, and that's what you have to do because gradualism doesn't work in, in this kind of abrupt climate change uh, world. And I think almost everyone who is paid to do this, uh, everyone who's trying to solve climate change, they're trying to solve it for 2100 or 2200, you know, because that's, they, they, they still believe that that's when it's going to really hit the fan. So that's why when we should try start solving it, right? You have to solve it for 2022, right? Well, you, you're more of an expert on this than me, but I, it all hangs on the, the Arctic climate science as far as I can see. And my assessment from just, you know, gleaning stuff really from the internet and talking to people like you and, and just looking at uh, climate re reanalyzer and stuff like that is, a, you know, I watch climate reanalyzer every single day for a year now. <laughs> okay. The Arctic temperature anomaly is off the charts, literally off the charts. Yeah, yeah. The charts go up to six degrees Celsius temperature anomaly for the sea surface temperature. Mm. It's been six degrees all on the ESAS for mm. most of the summer. Yeah. It, you, you cannot tell me this thing is on average 58 meters deep. You cannot tell me there's a six degree temperature anomaly. It's higher. It's about two degrees Celsius to surface temperature. You want to tell me? That, that basically permafrost cap on the clathrates is, is basically going to be intact. And, mm. and Samalitov and uh, Shakova are saying that it's breaking up. It's yeah. only a few meters deep. And there's 15 kilometers, 15 kilometers deep of clathrates underneath it. Yeah, so um, this is easily, easily the, the biggest danger we face. So if it's not the biggest danger, we at least need scientists to tell us that it's not critically dangerous. Because yeah. By my analysis, I, I think that, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that Arctic uh, climate scientists are saying somewhere between 2022 and 2025, we're going to get the blue ocean event. Now, I can't see after a blue ocean event that we've got long in terms of the class rates. So, so we're really talking 20 to 2022 to 2025. And thereafter, we're throwing dice. Yeah, and uh, so I, I, I totally agree if, with you. If, you. if your strategy is, but, but if it's your strategy is carbon neutral by twenty twenty five, it's like, <laughs> tell me what that does for the fucking class rates. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it, is like, oh, it's climate uh, justice, or the animal XR, or basically be going vegan. What does yeah. that do for the class rates in the Arctic? It's uh, basically no, I, um, I totally agree with you, and I think we need. Uh, I think we need to talk about or think about uh, what are we doing when uh, a solution is not forthcoming because the solution is not possible you know it's like uh, if you yes. if you if you jump out from the empire state building you know and, and there's concrete uh, street uh, below uh, you can't really uh, change your decision to jump when you're like 10 meters above the ground you know it's, it's like some things are already over the edge and they are falling rapidly you know so even though you're alive when you're 10 meters above above the ground your your prospects are not looking very good so i think we have to talk about uh, uh what do we do after society collapses what do we do after three degrees four degrees how how on earth are we going to be on earth basically yeah, so, so I'm ready for that discussion, and that's the Jim Bendel discussion, and I think that that's where we should be at. I think that's where XR should be at. I understand that people might, might not quite be there yet, but this is, personally, this is the way I see it, because I've, I've worked with systems, you know, my whole life, They're, you know, my whole working career, 30 years, I've worked with computer systems, you know, I've, I've been a pilot, I've flown planes, I've been a a skipper on boats and basically I've worked with big systems and complex systems and so from my uh, experience with systems uh, systems theory is that it's quite simple and well known they, they learned this lesson in the Apollo missions and they I was very pleased to read once that they came to this conclusion during the Apollo missions and that's when something screws up mm. you backtrack on the last thing you did 
because that's probably the damn thing that did it. Mm. And then what do you do next? Wait, don't fuck with anything. <laughs> the biggest danger is you start trying to think it through, second guessing, start fucking with things. That's the danger of um, SRM, solar radiation management and all these things, geoengineering. Yeah. You don't do that. The earth is a complex system. Yeah. We fucked it up by putting too much CO2 in. Mm. So you reverse that. That's step number one. You reverse that, and then you wait. You stop that dead. It's basically it's Apollo 13. You know, you flick that switch, or hell breaks loose. <laughs> you don't leave that switch in the on position and then try and think what's going on and try and correct mm. it. You switch that off, and then it will be fucked up for quite a while. It might get even more fucked up after you switch it off. Hmm. But you still wait. You you try and let the system. It's far too complex to second guess. It's far too complex to rationalize. If you do, you're more likely to destabilize it more. So you just wait, and hmm. that's the situation we're in. We know we've done industrial society. It's no use talking about the damage we've done since you know, basically a baseline in the, when the industrial revolution started. We said we started the industrial revolution. It fucked up. We stop the industrial revolution and wait. We yeah. don't worry about the class rates. We don't do anything more. We just need to stop this train and wait and see. And that's basic theory that basically they even did on Apollo. So that's my instinct. That's what I would recommend to the world. But it means uh, basically billions of people are going to die. If you stop this machine, billions of people are going to die. I'm saying like, mm. yeah, tough decision, but... That's something we have to come to terms with, is billions of people are going to die. Now we just have to determine how many. But really, if uh, if anybody is surviving, including ourselves, including people in Britain and Exxon, if they are surviving on the global production and distribution of, of uh, food, particularly grains like rice, um, you know, they... They're going to have to make plans, but we have to shut the system down. It's basically a, the same situation like you're in a submarine, yeah. and you've got to get the water tight doors closed. Now, everybody on a submarine knows that you have to get through that door because they're going to shut it in your face. It's, it's just, you, you know, and they accept that because that's the price you pay to save the crew. Yeah. The majority of the crew will be saved if you shut the watertight door in the face of all the guys in the forward compartments. And that's where we are in, in the world situation is, you know, a lot of people in urban areas and in, in the cities, um, they can't be sustained if we pull the plug. Now, they're never going to pull the plug on themselves. So it means that we have to basically take radical action to close the watertight doors in people's faces. And uh, we, we just, it's, it's a question of, when we can get realistic and come to that conclusion. So I would say the very first thing is to see, are Shakova <laughs> and company correct? Because mm. it's a very, very serious consequence if you decide to basically cripple the system. Yeah, and that, was, that was a discussion, that, was a discussion then, then, that I wanted to have when I, when I joined the, the XR uh, climate forums uh, and uh, online and stuff. I wanted to have exactly that discussion with people you know, with other skilled people within XR who knows one or two things about the climate. So, is this really this serious? Uh, are there any reasons to not believe them? Blah, blah, blah. Lots of discussions to be having. Uh, you know, like real discussions, not discussions where you try to win the other one over, but discussions where you bring facts and stuff on the table, right? But yeah. that, that seems to be no interest whatsoever. Uh, within the XR ranks about uh, having that discussion and you know they actually uh, they put out a, a climate change fact sheet you know, the, the, this uh, XR HQ the headquarters back in April uh, March April and you know what Extinction Rebellion's uh, climate change fact sheet for activists has doesn't mention the Arctic and doesn't ma mention ice at all, even though and they ice in the Arctic loops, right? Yeah, they I think, but uh, they, even loops, even though the crucial thing. even though ice and frozen ground in the Arctic, like the permafrost, is 
very fast taking over as the biggest uh, carbon emitter on the planet. Humans are number two. We are, we are good number two. We used to be number one, but these days, because of the melting and stuff that we've set in... in uh... The fires. The, the fires, to me, are looking so obviously like a feedback loop. Yeah, they um, are. And they're releasing they're huge, they're... huge amounts of carbon and soot as well. Well, if if the fires are, are bigger next uh, in 2020 than they were in 2029, then you know we're on the short fuse. Yeah, because yeah. That, that's a that's a feedback loop that would carry on no matter what we do yeah. with industrial emissions. So I think it all comes down so, to uh, it comes to, it kind of comes down to uh, a phenomenon I've witnessed many times uh, through my long activist life. It's like people. Yeah, I sort of come from a, yeah, let's say, let's say a, a, a large part of my background is like uh, scientific, natural sciences, right? But I have philosophy and literature and stuff as well, but forget about that. But uh, people seem to think that, yeah, they chose social science or, or history or, you know, other fields of study, and they believe that they can use social science to understand the Arctic, you know, they can like... Yeah, look, that's a, there's a danger that we're using politics to understand yeah. economics. So I think they can, I think they can look at, uh, I think they can look uh, at uh, the people who are studying the Arctic. Oh, he's got a long beard. What does that mean? I think they can use social studies uh, in order to figure out what the situation is in under the Arctic Ocean uh, and how deep the layers of uh, of methane are, uh, and they can't be told. Sadly, they can't be told that they are wrong. That now you have to actually have to study the molecules and the clathrate uh, ice itself. That's the only way to gain knowledge about this. You have to use logic. Well, you, you have to take things in in the uh, order of threat, right? So the, I, th I think the biggest threat is uh, what uh, Shikova and Samalitov have said. So, mm. so you know, basically, just reiterating, I think that basically the first thing is to just see if they're true. If mm. if they're true, then basically, how much time have we got? And I think we both agree it's somewhere between twenty twenty two and twenty twenty. Five before things really are—you really are rolling the dice hard. The probabilities are, are getting high of a, of a catastrophic methane burst. burst. But if that is the case, we really are on a timeline uh, before 2025. Uh, and so, so then, if you're sure of that, it means that you have to stop the system, uh, no matter what anybody says. Now, it's a question of how do you stop the, the global industrial system. And I think it can be done relatively easy. I think 300 uh, people in the right places could do it. So when people like uh, Jim Bendel and, and such come out, like he did in his video, they mentioned this thing like truthteller.life. Um, it's kind of a whistleblowing site where they kind of imagine people will come and you know expose you know the underbelly of this toxic system and say like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, Exxon doesn't have time to be Julian Assange, right? Uh, and we don't need Julian Assange of everybody knows this is a toxic system. You don't need to gild the lily. You don't need to tell everybody, you know, what Exxon did or what they knew for 40 years. Everybody knows, right? Let's move on and say, but that side is useful. What yeah. that side needs to do is to not say, you know, oh, you know, this is what I heard. This is the... the reports that I co-authored that proved that Exxon knew this and they're like, you need to basically get uh, all these points of sensitive dependence in the system boxed. So that there, there are all these people that know sensitive points of the system, they know the choke points, they know all the vulnerabilities of the system. And on, under the pretext that you basically showing to the world how vulnerable the system is and making it more robust, basically being a, a good citizen and reporting the holes in the fences, that really you dox the system's vulnerabilities so that basically people can use, let's call a variety of tactics somewhere down the line. Because at some point, 
we're going to need to use a variety of tactics. Yeah. Yep. You know what I mean by that expression? Right? Yeah, I know what you mean. So, uh... so basically, the, that that site, um, you know, uh, that whistleblowing site, I, I think, should be used for, for that purpose, uh, basically as insurance for the fact that we need a good list of targets when people start uh, basically dismantling the system. Yeah, because I think there's uh, like... Uh, uh, yep, the system is think, not going to hang itself. I'll say it again. No, no, I, think there's a, itself. I think there's a list of 100 companies that are responsible for 75% of the carbon emissions or something. So some, uh, yeah, some people that's in... that's not going to the root, right? No, 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 but, uh, the, the root is the financial system. Ultimately... Yeah. It's you got to go to the root, and where the, the whole system is most vulnerable is in the financial system. Is is my belief, but Exxon has to get sophisticated. We, you know, I heard Gail uh, Bradbrook talking about, um, you know, about going after banks, and she she obviously doesn't know what the bloody retail and commercial banking is. She <laughs> honestly thinks that oh, you could go and blockade one branch of a bank <laughs> and then it'll carry on and all that. Right? A branch of a bank is a retail branch, right? Yeah, yeah. Retail branches are only open so that they can get people off the street to get loans. Yeah. The bank does not want your money. they just basically giving you retail banking, taking a loss. It causes a loss. Banking, when you bank with a bank, it, it it's a loss. Retail banking is a loss maker. Hmm. They only do it because they want a loan. So forget about your view of Retail banks and blockading a bank, right? There's the financial system. The trillions of dollars exchanged in financial exchanges. The, there are instruments. There's the derivatives market. You've got, got to get sophisticated. You've got to learn about this. They honestly thought, people like Rupert Reid honestly thought that you could basically shut down the London Stock Exchange by basically going down to Bank or Threadneedle Street and blockading the exchange. Oh, the exchange is not there, you <laughs> morons. The, the exchange is in a greenfield site. Yeah, it's like uh, the, the, the bank is on like computer centers that are bombproof in a greenfield yeah. site, well out of the city. Those need to be doxxed, right? You need at some stage there there will be will be on a short fuse, and those things need to be doxxed. XR can do a valuable contribution. A whistleblower site like that. The guys that work there, they mm. know what that site is vulnerable. They they can basically, and on the basis of telling the world, doing a good citizen thing and explaining to the world that there's a very vulnerable piece of infrastructure right here in this computer center that nobody knows it out in some greenfield side. Let, let, let me you know. just go back uh, to four minutes here because, uh, uh, you know, a variety of tactics is all good and well, but I, we have to have a better understanding i think of uh the rt system and what you, what you were talking about so the thing is that yeah maybe maybe the blue ocean and the and the clath rates the methane blows like in 2025 or maybe in 28 or maybe in 30. the the big thing is that we know that it is past the point where it will not blow do you understand so, so it's because like we, sure, we, we, we know sure that. Yeah. we should make sure no, that yeah, first, we, we know, and then basically start a variety of We know, we of know absolutely sure, sure you know <laughs> absolutely for certain that we are past the point where it will not blow. So it's like, does it happen this year, next year, next decade, in two decades? We don't know. Maybe forty percent of it happens in in one decade, and the, the, and the rest stop, of it. Can we stop it blowing? No. If, if we stopped all the CO2 emissions now... No, it doesn't matter. Because the Arctic is already like four or five degrees uh, warmer than it used to be. And it, uh, 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 SNS, Semiletto and uh, Shakova, they, they uh, documented uh, in a report how the thawing of the subsea layers is like uh, half a meter or something uh, and, and uh, accel yeah. accelerating, right? Yep. Every year it, it falls like uh, 30 to 50 16, centimeters. 16, 16 centimeters, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and that, that, that is ramping up. That is going faster and faster. And as sooner or later yeah. you're going you're gonna to hit huge pockets of ice or open gas even, free gas. Yeah. Uh, and that is all. Everything is uh, dependent on how hot the Arctic Ocean has become. And it, it is 
already warm enough if you take all the layers, warmer layers further down, uh, further below, it's already warm enough to melt the uh, Arctic sea ice over and over many times. It's just a matter of how many storms can you get to to, to mix the layers and stuff. So, but, so, so, but if we're in, you're, you're saying we're in runaway already. The uh, if you, if you look at the exponential curve, it's like it's 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 not going very fast here, but it, you know it will go very fast up here. Uh, so okay, we, but so it's like it's like we, uh, we, we have we already we have already gone into a nose dive for the Arctic sea ice because the uh, the Arctic Ocean is warming more and more every year, and that will if, um, you know. Uh, in uh, it's, there's no other way for the sea floor to re react but thaw. You know, it's in right. But but can we refreeze? Inescapable. The inescapable. Can, yeah. can we can we refreeze the Arctic? No. How would you do that? Would you dump a lot of uh, refrigerators uh, in the east? Or... No, no. You you, you just um, draw down CO two in the atmosphere. No, it doesn't matter anymore because you have so much uh, methane up there from uh, from the sea and from the permafrost, and you have so much uh, CO two every year from the forest fires. Uh, so it's like, yeah, we can we can uh, be nice and gather. Uh, virtual single points uh, in our you know online world and uh, human societies but you know you know what the arctic ocean doesn't care what we do down here mm. but, but nobody's come out <laughs> and done the uas paper what you broke up sorry. nobody's come out and, and done a wasf paper uh there are some candidates i think already um I mean, I mean, like Jim Bendel's paper is not very scientific. It's not very rigorous no. from an academic point of view. Is, is there a technical paper that somebody says, "Look, we've modeled it in any way you look at"? Yeah, there are some. I can, I can send you, I can send you some because I've found, uh, you know, like a handful of people uh, through the last years uh, who have who have done a really good work on this, and of course they are not very popular. It goes without saying. Yeah, yeah, but what what I'm saying is, um, okay. So people have gone into this and McPherson and stuff, and then basically people not not talking about guy. I'm player. not talking about guy here. He's he's not one of those five. No. But but I mean things like Wadham or something like that, right? Peter Wadham. I mean somebody that's mainstream and and basically broke away, and and came out with a paper. He, he just said like, okay, enough of this crap, and published the paper. Yeah, you have, you have, you have uh, a guy called Vostel, Vostel, David Vostel or something. Uh, you have people who have documented the the climate tipping point being uh, gone and, and passed. Uh, you know, so uh, yeah, you have lots of people, and some of them have been influential. You know, in uh, also in government circles. But it's like you know, just just forget about them. Uh, because their message is too, too dark, right? Hmm. So, then, uh, what's the point of activism then? What so XR's aim is 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 ludicrous. So, so the mainstream thinks that there's no problem, and all the problems, you know, twenty one hundred. XR thinks that the government can do something about it. Jim Bendel thinks we can't do anything about it. But what should we be doing? Yeah, that, that's that's sort of my my uh, one of my largest problems with the the diversity of tactics, or you know, going rogue, uh, or or sort of blowing up uh, uh, bank computers or whatever. Uh, is that? Hey, I never said that. No, 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 but uh, no, but uh, let, let, let me finish. Let me finish. Uh, this video. No, but uh, even even though even though some people could go through with it and and it would succeed in you know stopping the the, the financial uh, uh, circus, uh, it would in in my analysis it would perhaps only you know give us. 
two months more before before the multiple continent breadbaskets uh, shut down. Uh, it, it's like, why would you create a, a, a huge stink uh, just, you know, uh, months before it comes uh, crashing down anyway? Uh, I don't see the point of that. Uh, just because of the uncertainty factor. Mm. So, so we're not absolutely sure that we've gone through the tipping points. So basically, uh, you know, even if you're heading for the ground in the, you know, the plane's heading for the ground that's out of gas on fire and everything, you, you still basically put out the fire on the engines and try and pull up, even though you look like you're, you, you basically die trying, right? Isn't that the, the theory? Yeah, but, but, it's, but it's like... Uh, you see so, or I see so <laughs> little uh, work being done on uh, on what what year in the past we we, we crossed the tipping point. It's, it's uh, almost no people working on this. At least uh, overt uh, scientists, maybe some covert uh, deep state scientists are working on it. But I see very little oh, work. Yeah, sure, they are. I see very little work uh, on that, and I think we, see, we can see in society today, we can see loads and loads of signs that they know that it's already too late. You know, it's like... Um, yeah, my... I mean, I think, uh, I think the, the deep state scientists have, have reported already, and I think all the way back since 1974 and the limits of growth and stuff, mm -hmm. I think that, that basically the, the security analysis has been that there's nothing we can do, and that that basically explains why there's so much lethargy on the on the part of governments. Um, they they all seem to know that there's nothing we can do. You, you know, you can read it uh, quite easily, but shouldn't we second guess them? Because one, I think, from the limits of growth and the Club of Rome and stuff, what they're assuming is that you know the the global population cannot be slowed down. The, the average person, like the people in Canning, you know, wrote there, they pulled, you know, the, the public, they pulled the protesters off. They assume that those guys are going to demand, like, uh, that uh, we don't stop the global economy. They, you know, they assume that you would be overrun by bread riots if you tried to stop the system. What, what I'm trying to say is they're thinking in terms of insiders and basically pre preservers of the system. What they're not thinking of is the rogue element. So if you had, say, 300 lone wolves that basically uh, attacked the system and brought it down, they're not including that scenario because that's not in their wheelhouse, right? Nobody, in the, even in the deep state, could say, well, we could sabotage the system. Yeah, but, but isn't you, that possible? Yeah, but you're not, that, you're that, not listening to what I'm saying. You're not listening to what I'm saying. Uh, you know, I could... Uh, I could put, put uh, a gang of thousand uh, extreme uh, anarchist eco anarchists in my novel, and they would, you know, blow up this, and they would uh, attack this, and assassinate uh, X and Y and Z. But even even if they did that in a novel or in the real world, it's like. Uh, heat is still gonna melt snow and ice, right? You can't have a vote on on whether. No, isn't in the point of that is that it's a, it's grasping at straws, but you you still grasp at the straw, isn't that the point? Of being, you know. I'm I'm, a, I'm more like, you know, if when when uh, a sufficient amount of people realize that this uh, this thing is going south, is going down the drain, I'm more like uh, in favor of point bomb informing the others who didn't understand it yet and point two saying goodbye to whatever mountain area forest area uh, glaciers uh, animals plants that you love the most uh, other people would say say goodbye to people only because most people let's face it only care about other people but for me it would be like taking a farewell with this mountain valley uh, taking farewell with, with my pet glacier back in Hardanger in Norway uh, and basically trying to like you've said in many of your videos try to, to get some kind of 
purification in uh, realizing that the civilization and the culture and the science they love so much is all going away, is going down the drain, and you're gonna live with it and you're gonna die with it. Okay, but you you you're missing the you're not going further enough down the dialogue in this movie because if you follow through what you say, I've been saying that you need the same thing. I've been saying you need catharsis, mm. basically. Then, uh, when you've done all that, you've got over the grief. Um, then you need retribution, right? <laughs> That's or one of the things that everybody misses. That yeah. basically round this off when the rightness is all is you need a period of retribution. You mm. can't deny yourself that. That's one of the things XR wants to do and say we don't have a blame culture. Yes, we do. Even though this part of your brain says we don't have a blame, you know, a blame culture. Ninety-nine percent of the rest of your brain says yes, we need to get even. <laughs> yeah. So we need retribution. That's part of reconciliation. You can't have reconciliation that's just all forgiveness. You need retribution, and then you can have reconciliation. So get over it. We need re we need uh, retribution. Forget about your no blame culture. There needs to be blame. And yeah, I think okay. we saw. I think we saw retribution on the. I think no, it's all no, retribution no, 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 on the no, no, no. on the subway this, this morning in London. There was retribution. Yeah, yeah, okay, but that, not that. No, that's unenlightened retribution. I mean, guys that know that we're on the skids. So, so then this is when you know we're on the skids. So, okay, so so then once you have that, then uh, you basically do what you're saying. That's basically reconciliation and and uh, saying goodbye hmm. and catharsis, right? So, but after, so all of this doesn't take very long. Then you've got all that wrapped up. What do you do? You don't go back to work, get on the sub train, go back to your, your job. What do you do at that point? Well, I'll tell you what you do. Ataraxia. So part of ataraxia is, okay, it's Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Mm. You know, you, okay, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, if you remember the final scene, they all hold up, they all... Basically, they're never going to get out of this it's alive. They're, they're in a barn. They know it's quits. Right? So they do all that, say their prayers, make their peace with God. And then what do they do? They come out shooting. Hmm. So that's what I'm saying is there's this come out shooting part. <laughs> so go through all of this, get to catharsis, and then it's ataraxia. It's basically you go down fighting. Mm. And so that's why I'm saying, I mean, like, okay, say, if a few thousand pe people watch this video, right, I'm not talking to all the naysayers and all the guys that have some clever dick thing to say, and say I'm talking to like 10 people out of this that basically mm. can listen to me and hear what I'm saying. I'm saying, you know, I'm saying two words, lone wolf, lone wolf, lone wolf. Okay? That's three words. Six they, words, six words. Okay, six <laughs> words, <laughs> three times two words, lone wolf, lone wolf, lone wolf. I'm saying that basically the guy, there are guys out here that can hear what I'm saying, saying that uh, in the history of this planet, we've come to the brink so many times, and they're the unsung heroes. There's basically been a Soviet guy that, you know, refused to launch the missiles when yeah. it looked like there was a strike. Kim Philby saved the world by Spasiba. informing Stalin. And basically, all of these guys have, you know, they're, they're these examples of unsung heroes that the world is going to hate, but basically will sacrifice themselves to basically save humanity. It's, there's a long tradition of doing it. I'm saying the guys aren't there. They know who they are. They know if you're sitting on a button with your finger on some, some kind of button that uh, controls the system, mm. uh, flick it. Flick it, man. Just just flick it. You know, nobody's going to praise you. Nobody's even going to understand you. You don't need to write a manifesto. Um, you you can either dox it, put it on something like a whistleblower website like XR Scott, or uh, flip it. Uh, you know, uh, if you understand the situation, you say it's it's not trying to save it, it as much as it is, to, um, you know, ataraxia, the attitude that you choose to go out with after Reconciliation, retribution, grief, and catharsis. Um, there's, there's still, then you gird your loins and you go out there <laughs> in a blaze of fire. <laughs> That's my message. Right? Going out in a so blaze I'm of fire. I'm hoping to miserably. 
but I'm hoping it's 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 uh, it's incubating these you know our frustrated group of people only needs a handful, but a frustrated group of people. I'm hoping it's incubating them um, to take on this task, and then maybe we get lucky. Maybe uh, maybe there's some people left. Maybe there's some of the ecology left, even if we all die out. Uh, I think we're both in agreement that mm. you know we we want as much preserved of the ecosystem as possible, and that's the way to do it, right? Yeah, and in the Norway, there's been a um... A recurring debate ever since uh, the government in the south uh, dammed the huge uh, mountain valley from the for the Sami people where the reindeer herders are are, are um, living. Uh, there was a huge conflict back then, and then there's been a debate in like uh, eco philosopher circles about whether or not it would be morally right to blow up that dam, right? You know, not mm -hmm. not damaging any people or anything. Uh, but just blow it up because it was a mistake. Even the Prime Minister Brundtland, who built it, uh, admitted uh, as much. No, it was a mistake and a, and a violent assault on the Sami indigenous people. Uh, so uh, if you're going to be a lone wolf, and I wouldn't recommend it, even though, even though, even if it had been legal to recommend it, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, then at least I would I would go blowing up uh, like that those kinds of installations in nature that are actually killing the salmon actually uh, taking the uh, the grasslands away from the reindeer and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, oh, but I, I I don't like that kind of action because that's that's a very high personal cost to not much benefit. I, I would only say uh, to somebody that, that that knew, you know, there are all these people that sit in boring jobs at some of the crucial infrastructure that people don't know about. That could, you know, basically I would say, you don't want to do an action like this unless you know that it's going to have a very far reach consequences. So basically, I'm not saying go, go monkey wrench stuff. I'm saying is if you're one of the handful of people that are sitting on a lever that is controlling this system, and there there are there, there are places where you could put a handful of sand in the gears and bring the world economy to to uh, a shuddering halt. Um, those people know who they are. Um, I you know I don't know who they are. We we don't know who they are, but they know who they are, and I'm just calling to them say do it. You know, you know, you're sitting on a lever that could uh, change the world. So just, just do it. And I'm not talking about guys in missile silos. I mean, things in, uh, you know, particularly things like the financial system and stuff. Yeah, but is uh, it Nick Is it, but is it like really that. worth it though? Uh, if it's not going to solve the larger situation, if it's just uh, going to be about uh, going out in a blaze of glory, why, why would they, you know, why would they risk their job when they could? Uh, at least uh, prepare the future for their closest family uh, by staying in the job. Mm -hmm. uh, because I don't see it uh, solving the larger problem of uh, the Arctic melting down and, and uh, our cities uh, being flooded and uh, our food baskets, bread baskets going offline. Uh, so, you know. Uh, no, it, it probably won't, but there the, are the two things. Uh, the, first, the first one is that it's just an attitude of mind to go out on. So mm. it's a noble attitude of mind. You don't want to go out with a whimper. You want to go out with a bang. Yeah. So you want to go out in a blaze of glory like uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. If you know your number's up, um, you know, go out on a high note. So that's, that's the one argument. It's, you're not really looking for the result. Uh, but second, we may get lucky, right? This system's a complex system. We may get lucky. There may be all sorts of, um, you know, variables that we don't know about that, that may kick in. But you, you, you can't really do anything about the clap rates. You can't do anything about the tundra melting and the permafrost uh, going into feedback. You can't really do anything about this. But if you are one of the people that sits at one of the sensitive points um, in the global system, you know you can do something about that. So then you, you would, wouldn't you? 
Yeah, but you wanted. It reminds me too much of, uh, you know, just I'm just making an example. Uh, let's say, okay, we can't solve climate change, but let's try to get gay marriage in Saudi Arabia illegal. I mean, it's like it, it, it's not quite like that because the gay marriage wouldn't potentially solve the climate crisis. If you if you trip the global <laughs> economy, and you you might you know stop CO two. I mean, the aim would be to stop CO two. But if you were in one of those crucial positions and you could potentially stop CO two emissions, uh, or you were one of maybe three hundred people that collectively could do it, uh, that may stop climate change. So that's the false thing in your example is uh, gay marriage is, is, is not, has no relevance in any yeah. imaginable the, scenario of climate change. In, in the long but, term, uh, in, in the long the term. financial system and stopping the Bolton Road Initiative in China might have, might, might save us. In the long term, the population numbers in Saudi Arabia might go down because people weren't uh, feeling the pressure to, 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 to live in uh, heterosexual uh, yeah, but it's not realistic. relations. It, it, it's, it's not a hopeful action, right? I would, I would say that something that is a hopeful action you should do. Mm. No, I'm, I'm just uh, basically saying that uh, people are, to, to a very large extent, they are going for the low-hanging fruit. You know, it's like, it's easier to, to fight, for, uh, fight for and win the struggle for gay marriage in Saudi Arabia, at least because it's an ally of Israel and America. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, but so, so, it's, so, it's a distraction, right? Yeah, but the, 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 the whole... It's a form of denial. The whole society... It's, it's basically just coping with... The whole society is full, full of distractions, and, and uh, if, you look at, if you look at the core beliefs of XR, it's all about, uh, you know... Um, you know, diversity and, and all the, that kind of thing that are uh, consisting of struggles that we've already won, you know, like uh, inclusion of all uh, population groups, skin color, uh, blah, blah, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, uh, gender equality, all of those things that we already solved, those are being fought equally as important within XR as the climate thing and you have got you got, you got this uh, co-founder of XR uh, coming out uh, earlier this year with a, with a piece uh, in uh, in medium uh, saying that uh, XR is not about climate you know so, so yeah, it's like yeah, yeah, sure. yeah may, maybe you know maybe 60 70 percent of, of the people of the XR rebels, they don't do this for climate. They do it for, you know, LGBT and. Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, it's no use. Uh, it's no use complaining about them. I would say that ninety-eight percent of people in exile must surely be there, just to basically as a palliative for their eco anxiety. Mm -hmm. So basically, just people are, are just doing something to relieve their um, anxiety and feel good. So yeah, that's ninety-eight percent. But those people are right off. You're never going to be able to do anything for them. I'm, I'm hoping in this video to talk to the frustrated people that realize what we just said. Yeah, Basically, because yeah. I think the genesis of XR, XR's finished. I mean, come on. At this stage, they can do a debt strike. They can go after the financial system. But any way you look at it, they. I said before in these videos, three strikes and you're out. They've done the three strikes. They're out. They're just going through the motions from here. They can, sure, I could give them a strategy to go off to the financial industry and try and pick it up. But what, the reason why they're at is they're on that 20 to 30 year track now. Right? Mm -hmm. they, they've lost credibility. They, they basically, now they have to do a correction. You can never win back your credibility. Right? They'll never dig themselves out of this hole after they've done three strikes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, okay, they can fulfill some kind of function, but now they are the CND, they Greenpeace, they just an NGO, they just some prestes on the fringe whining about climate change, and eventually everybody will catch up and say, "Hey, you know, XR, we're right." <laughs> that will be two decades too late. <laughs> yeah. So they are relevant, but here's the thing: what I think their genesis is is that 
there must be people that are frustrated and they are incubating a group of people that would probably be the 300 or so people that, um, you know, I would talk to and say, you know, lone wolf. <laughs> one word, one word. Uh, two words. <laughs> But that, that's my that's my message to Exile right there. I mean, uh, you know, yeah, you can go, yeah, carry on, you know. But but now you're a club. You, you're just an eco anxiety club, and yeah, you might as well just go for feel good things. But uh, Jim Bendel is way ahead, way mm. ahead of the curve. And uh, I think now Jim Bendel picks picks up the baton. Um, he has the torch. Um, go, Jim, go. That's yeah. that's how I would like to end this video. It's like I always say, uh, if I have to dance in the revolution, it's not my revolution. Yeah. <laughs> now you've given yourself away. You and Anna Golden. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys, anybody watching this video, we're not anarchists. We're not anarchists. Don't yeah. listen to them. We're not anarchists. And also, uh, I would like to add a disclaimer here. Obviously, for all you watching, um, uh, both my colleague um, Lord Yu and I are climate uh, fiction novelists, so, so we've only been talking about fictional narratives in, in this video. So if you got any idea from watching this to do this or that, that's all in your head because we're just talking about possible narratives inside a fictional context, right? I'm writing every day. Uh, the book will be coming out shortly, and probably self-published for 99 cents. Um, look out for it. Excellent. And uh, Torsten's book, too. So, yeah, these are just ideas for a novel. Uh, Two anybody novels. Anybody in the Two deep novels. state wants to read the novel, that's cool, too. That's cool, too. But I, I don't want to be like... Uh, Roger Hallam said, hey... Prison's just a book club. That's what he said in that time. Is now thing is like, I don't want to be in his book club. Okay, <laughs> okay, there was Okay, anyway, author yeah. to author. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank Just you to... very much, uh, Lord, and good luck with your uh, novel. And uh, let's have a little competition to to be the first one out with a novel, right? Yep. Uh, fist bump. Fist bump. Fist bump. Bye. Going south, going south. Going south, going south.